right, good morning, everybody. Right. So I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, so I think some of this might be uh, somewhat repetitive for those patients that I see, because I think I have a lot of these discussions in the clinic room, too. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk about a topic that's incredibly important, which is how do we uh, work to prevent melanoma, and what do we do to detect it as early as possible when we can? I know uh, from Dr. Messina's questions earlier, there's a lot of folks who've actually had melanoma before in this room. Uh, and so this is still a very relevant talk because you can develop subsequent melanomas. So these strategies still apply to everybody and we really want you to hopefully walk away with a few pearls that'll help you in your protection strategy. So when you talk about uh, melanoma prevention, there's really two pieces to it. There's the idea of primary prevention and the idea of secondary prevention. Uh, the difference between these two is essentially when you talk about primary prevention, it's the steps you can take to really reduce the chance that you'll ever develop a melanoma in the first place. And then the secondary prevention piece is how do we detect it if you're going to grow one as early as possible. Just like Dr. Messina said, if we can find one that's early and before it's uh, invasive or at least a local melanoma, that'd be much easier to take care of and have a much better prognosis. So of course, when we talk about primary prevention, avoiding UV exposure is very, very important. Ultraviolet light that comes from the sun when you're outside is a key part of melanoma um, development. And so if we can reduce it or, or eliminate um, a large extent of that UV exposure, we can reduce the overall risk. Um, and what we want to do is go through a few guidelines that I think if you combine together can be really effective in reducing your chances of developing melanoma. So uh, one thing I do want to say as we talk about this, uh, although uh, we think about melanomas as being in many ways preventable, there's certain ones that occur that are not directly linked to UV exposure. Those are ones that occur in uh, places that are often sun protected, the ones that occur in the mouth and the genitals and in the eyes. So uh, other kind of monitoring plants outside of just your skin exam is really important and I know we have that discussion a lot with our patients as they come into clinic. So of course, sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Uh, I think you probably have heard this over and over from every single person at, at Moffitt and, and many people in uh, general practice as well. And you have to get into the routine of doing it daily. Um, and we all live and breathe it. I'm wearing SPF 50 right now on my face, so I hope most of you are too. Um, so this is a very important um, prevention strategy. You want to make it part of your daily routine. Mine sit, re sits right next to my toothpaste and my toothbrush in the morning. So when I get out of the shower, I put that on and I, before I leave the house. Um, and a lot of people think that you only need to put sunscreen on when you're going out to the beach or you're going to be spending a day at the golf uh, course, but really this should be part of your daily routine. You know, we have the benefit of living in an incredibly beautiful sunny place like Tampa or in Florida in general, but unfortunately that also brings that additional risk because we are getting a lot more UV exposure than a lot of other places. Um, and again, year round, whether it's cold outside like it is today or it's the middle of the summer and it's 100 degrees outside, um, the UV exposure is fairly consistent. And the other important piece is cloudy days does not reduce the amount of UV exposure you're going to get. I think often what happens is people will see overcast and they say, oh, I'm fine, I don't need to bother putting sunscreen on today. And, and that really is not the case because again, that UV exposure is still there. <coughs> so when we talk about sunscreen, there's a lot, a lot of, in terms of marketing. And you probably go to the aisle and now there's you know, 50 different types of sunscreen and brands and different prices. And it's very difficult to know what's the right choice. And, a lot of patients ask that question, and, and, and the reality is the brands don't matter um, to some degree. The ingredients are not as important, but it's really about how um, the details are in terms of what kind of protection they offer. So broad spectrum is the term you want to look at for any sunscreen you're trying to use. Broad spectrum refers to the idea that both the UVA and UVB uh, rays are uh, reduced or blocked by the sunscreen. Um, when we talk about SPF, and I have a few slides in just a minute about that, we're going to talk very in detail. So when you walk out of here today, you're going to fully understand what that number means and you have good uh, cocktail discussions with your friends. You can really educate them, okay? Um, minimum SPF 30. Anything that has under an SPF of 30 is probably more marketing just to sell the product than it is really going to give you good prevention. And I'll show you why that's the case. And of course, the amount of sunscreen that you put on is going to determine if you're actually getting the number on the bottle. Um, they've done some studies looking at real-world applications of sunscreen, and it, if you put on an SPF of 30, if you're just an average person putting it on, you're not putting a thick enough layer on, so the protection you're really getting is about half of that. Um, so one shot glass full or an ounce is how much sunscreen you should be using, and that is quite a bit if you ever actually pour it into a glass before you do it. So, And then of course, reapplying is really important. Um, every two hours is when you should reapply the sunscreen. Obviously, in a day-to-day -day routine, it's a little bit difficult, but especially when you're out and about, it's even more important. 
So a few years ago, uh, the FDA got involved because of all the marketing uh, strategies that people were doing to sell more sunscreens that weren't effective. So they really standardized this. And this is a picture of some, the older Neutrogena bottles. And you can see where the uh, deception to some degree is going on. The term sunblock is pretty much gone. I think a lot of us are still in the habit of saying that. But the reality is sunscreen is the more accurate term because it's not truly a block. Um, additionally, uh, SPF has really uh, become standardized to say you know, SPF 15 or higher is the only time really you can make a comment about it reducing skin cancer risk. And again, SPF 30 is the, the, the floor of what you should be using if you're going to go through the effort of putting on sunscreen in the first place. Um, uh, waterproof, you'll never see that term on a bottle again. Um, no sunscreen is waterproof. If you sweat a lot, if you're in the ocean, if you're in the pool, the sunscreen probably will come off and you'll need to reapply as soon as you come back out from there. So what exactly is SPF? Well, it stands for sun protection factor. And this is basically a number that helps you figure out how long, uh, how much longer you can stay out in the sun before you start getting that redness. Um, this is a very scientifically determined number. And what they essentially do is they have a person come in the lab, they put a UV light over them, they see how long it takes them to get red on the skin. It's called a minimal erythema dose. So let's say, for example, if you're out in the sun with no protection, it takes you about 10 minutes before you start getting red or starting the first signs of burn. That SPF is how many times longer you'll be able to stay out before you get that. So in this example, they're saying if you use an SPF of 15, you're going to go about 150 minutes, or the usual 10 minutes times a factor of 15. So you get 150 minutes before you have to reapply or before you start getting a little bit of that redness. <coughs> and so as we talk about the different SPFs, the biggest uh, misunderstanding is that if you go from a 15 to a 30, or you go from a you know, 30 to a 50 or 60, that you're doubling your sun protection. And that's not actually the case. Um, I think it's a really kind of neat diagram if you follow a little bit. This is actually the curve of how much UV protection you get. And you can see it's not a straight curve, it kind of levels off right here. So when you're using an SPF 15, you're getting about 93% protection. When you go to a 30, you get about 97%. And then after that, really, it's very, very minimal. So this is why typically we say to use you know, SPF 30 as a minimum, 30 to 50 in that range. And again, keeping in mind that this is the number of the bottle you only get if you put enough sunscreen on. So I tell my patients to use about a 50 because that probably means we're going to end up around a 30 because of the thinness of the layer they're using. So um, another strategy that's really helpful beyond just using sunscreens is clothing. Clothing is actually in many ways more effective than just the sunscreens because it doesn't wear off unless you take it off, of course. Um, so if you just have a regular t-shirt, a white t-shirt, um, typically it's an SPF of 4. And if you go to a colored one, you can get up to about an SPF of 18. And if you're wearing something like a, a jeans uh, on your daily basis, you can get up to even an SPF of 166. So really, um, protective clothing, tight-knit materials really work very effectively. Uh, and maybe an additional strategy to use. Uh, there's also companies that have come out with uh, what they call UPF, or uh, ultraviolet protect protection factor clothing. Salumbra is a company that does it, Columbia does it. It's become kind of a relatively good uh, trend now. They're a little bit more pricey, but they do work really well. There's good um, consumer reports uh, studies that actually test it out. Um, the important thing to remember, though, is, is after so many washes, a lot of that protection is lost. So typically, once a year or so, or every couple years, you're going to have to kind of throw them away and buy a new set, which is good for their stockholders. <laughs> All right, and then of course, seeking shade. This is something that um, is, is very, very important. Um, peak hours are between 10 to two or 10 to four, and uh, you should make all attempts during those times to be over some type, or under some type of tent or some type of sun protection. So um, for example, you know, we have Gasparilla today. Many of you may be going later on there. Trying to stay under a covered area may be a very good strategy. And of course, the beauty of Florida is we have a lot of water available to us, water and sand and all these things, but they actually often can reflect UV back onto you. So um, it's important to keep that in mind too if you're going to be doing outdoor water sports and all those things that you're probably getting some, de some degree of UV exposure additionally from the reflective surfaces. And then of course the strategy that we're trying to do by using all these things is to really prevent sunburns. Sunburns are uh, a very, very big risk factor for developing melanomas. And in fact, blistering sunburns in particular can put you at significantly increased risk to get melanoma at some point in your life. Um, a lot of folks have uh, as a child have blistering sunburns, and that's one of the questions when you see your dermatologist, they often will ask you, and did you have blistering sunburns as a child? And the idea is, again, trying to figure out that, okay, this person is, is higher risk and we want to make sure we advise them more or look at them a little more carefully. And so this is something that you want to keep in mind. Obviously, if you've had them in the past, that damage is already done, but you can prevent more uh, damage by avoiding getting bad sunburns or blistering sunburns in particular. 
And then this is my pet peeve, and I talk to more of my younger patients than anything else, and this is where your kids, your grandkids are, are, are really um, at risk. Um, tanning bed use in this country has exploded. It is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it is very little in terms of regulation. Uh, the regulation for a tanning bed is that of a tongue depressor in terms of the FDA class, and so it really is a completely uh, unregulated market that has a lot of risk for patients and unfortunately and oftentimes for the youngest folks. So they'll sell prom tans and they'll sell, in, uh, I had a patient uh, who is a student here and some of the apartment complexes for students actually have tanning beds in the apartment complex as a benefit. Um, so this is something that uh, I don't think many of you will probably be doing but it's very important to understand that that's much, much higher risk and that even limited tanning bed exposure can increase your lifetime melanoma risk. So, um, again, our, our friends and family who are young and getting exposed to this are going to uh, pay for it later. And I think 50 years from now, the way we look at smoking um, and all that that's happening there is how we're going to look at tanning beds. And then the other discussion I often, or questions I get from patients is, well, what about vitamin D? You know, I, I want to go out in the sun and get vitamin D, and that's very important, so I don't want to sun protect for that reason. Um, the reality is the best way to get vitamin D is through your diet. Um, Generally speaking, if you have a normal American diet, you're getting plenty of vitamin D supplementation in our dairy products and other uh, food items. So this really has uh, not been shown in terms of a significant risk using sunscreen. So I would not uh, use that as a reason to <coughs> discourage you from sun protecting. And then medication is something that's really important and, and often we don't spend a lot of time talking about this. There are a lot of medications that predispose you to get sunburns or to have a little bit more sun sensitivity. So a common example is an antibiotic called doxycycline that I know we use a lot in dermatology. Uh, this is one that will make you much more likely to, to burn out in the sun, so even though you normally would be doing okay out there, this may predispose you. So there's lots and lots of lists. Uh, these are just kind of a small subset of them, but I would encourage you to talk to your dermatologist, talk to their internist, the ones who are writing the medicines to say, hey, this new medication you're putting me on, is that gonna put me at risk to get a sunburn at all? Okay, so now we're going to move into the second part of the talk, which is secondary prevention. This is where I, as a dermatologist, uh, uh, play a key role as well as um, uh, each uh, your significant others and yourselves. So we take all the steps we were just talking about to reduce your risk for melanoma, but let's say you still develop one. Well, what can we do to catch that melanoma early? And this is really a team sport. Uh, just like Dr. Messino is showing, we're pretty good as dermatologists at picking up melanomas, but we're not 100%. And there's enough times where patients come in and they share stories where you know, their significant other, their friend, their colleague, or themselves noticed a spot that was new, that was very early, uh, just kind of a new spot that popped up and we biopsy it and it's melanoma. And as Dr. Messino is talking about, not all melanomas are the classic brown irregular spots that we're going to be talking about. So often a new spot that pops up that wasn't there can be just as concerning as a big, scary, dark, irregular mole that you're used to thinking about. <coughs> Uh, and so we talk a lot about this idea about self-exams. Um, and this is really important. We, all, we tell patients this, and to what degree people do, it's always variable. But um, I would encourage every one of you to do your own exams on a monthly basis. Just pick it first of the month, the last day of the month, and you get out of the shower and take a look at it. We're going to show you exactly how to do a good self-exam with a video and a few seniors that too. And additionally, of course, um, mo uh, most folks are getting annual um, skin examinations with dermatologists. Folks who've had melanoma have different monitoring guidelines, and I'll touch on that briefly. So, unfortunately, it's not this easy. Uh, if it was this simple, then it would be really easy to catch melanoma at a time. Uh, so, uh, short of this ever happening, you know, we have to talk about the thing that we talk about all the time, which is the ABCDEs. And I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. I know many of you are very familiar because you probably learned about these with your dermatologist as part of your normal monitoring, but I think it's important enough to review one more time. All right, so. A is asymmetry. Essentially, if you take a mole that you have and you draw a line right through the middle of it, do both halves look the same? Do they you know, fold onto each other? If they don't, that's asymmetry, and that's something that can be a red flag and something that can be concerning. B is border. Ideally, a mole should have a, a well-circumscribed, even, smooth border. In this case, you can see how this is very jagged and irregular. It's kind of hard to figure out where it starts and stops. And then often people will add bleeding as another B to think about. Uh, so a spot that starts bleeding uh, unexpectedly, a mole that's bleeding or itching would be something to mention. Color, uh, ideally your mole should be one even color, uh, not too dark, just a light brown or even evenly colored mole. If you see multiple colors, you see a dark area in the background of a light brown area, those are things that would often be of some concern you want to point out to your doctor. 
and then we talk about diameter. They say six millimeters. Well, nobody knows what six millimeters looks like. So they talk about this idea. If you remember your number two pencils from grade school, the size of that eraser, if you have a mold bigger than that, then that would be something potentially of concern. And just because you violate one of these doesn't necessarily mean it's something bad. It's just this idea that it may be of concern that needs to be evaluated a little further. And I think this is the most important, which is evolving. Things that change are the most important thing that you want to detect. And so we talk to patients a lot about know your spots. Um, you know, folks often <coughs> say that, well, it's hard for me to figure out. Everything looks kind of off. And I said, yeah, that's true. It's very difficult. But if you know what it looks like today, then you'll know what it looks like six months from now when it's changed. And the, the single best thing you can do for yourself is when you're doing those exams, if you notice a spot that wasn't there that popped up or a spot that's changed in any way, whether it's in color, shape, size, anything of uh, any uh, nature, you'd want to come into your dermatologist and perhaps if you're concerned, even come in earlier and have them take a look and let them use that additional skill set to figure out whether it's something that needs to be biopsied or, oh, hey, this is just a wisdom spot that's popped up. It's not a true mold. Don't worry about it. Okay, so I'm just going to show a, a brief one-minute video on how to do a self-exam. Um, and again, you know, we often people do their own exams, but you know, find a friend, find a partner, and have them help you because it's often difficult to look at spots on your back, um, and, uh, on your bottom. Um, and so you really want to have uh, somebody who can help you in those areas. But there are techniques with mirrors that you can do, and I'm going to show that briefly. Uh, and before I go into that, this is just a uh, kind of brief, brief diagram of how you can use. Uh, mirrors to really help you if you have two sets, so one that you can put in your hand and kind of one that's on the wall. And you can do a pretty good job of taking a look at your back, back of your head, your bottom, under your legs. And so this is a good strategy. Um, most of the dermatology office have resources like this to give you a printout of so you can kind of take home with you and figure out exactly how to do two. But I think the video is a lot more instructive. Start a self skin exam by looking at the f keep returning. You start a self skin exam. You start a self skin exam by looking at the front and back of your body. When examining your own skin, stand in front of a mirror, raise the arms, and examine the right and left sides of the body. Then bend your elbows and look carefully at your forearms, upper underarms, and palms. Next, examine the back of your legs, spaces between your toes and your soles. Then examine those hard to see areas like your back, buttocks, and the top of your head. Use a mirror to inspect the back of your neck and scalp, parting your hair for a better view. Become familiar with your skin, especially your moles, and alert your dermatologist about any changes to moles or spots in your skin. Catch All right. And then the last thing I just wanted to touch on was um, monitoring plans. So um, there are some guidelines with regards to how often you should be monitored after you've had a melanoma. Um, but we often customize this to the individual. So some patients we follow quarterly basis indefinitely. Other folks, after a few years, we go to six months. Other patients maybe we see once a year. So this is something that we often try to customize to the risk factors that individual patient has. Um, but typically what we tend to say is that if you have not had any history of skin cancer, once a year exams is, is how we approach it. Um, and then uh, if you had melanoma again, we kind of shift it based on how aggressive that melanoma was. And we do want to also emphasize you should do self lymph node exams. That means filling in your neck, under your arms, and the groin, along with your skin checks. So that's it. I want to also say thank you to one of my medical students. It's been very helpful in putting this talk together. So again, thank you very much. Have a good day.